Stephen King's fairy tale. Chapter 2 Mr. Bowditch, Radar, and Night in the Psycho House. I pedaled around the corner to the gate on Sycamore Street and leaned my bike against the sagging picket fence. The gate, short, hardly up to the waist, wouldn't open. I peered over it and saw a big bolt, as rusty as the gate it was bearing. I yanked on it, but it was frozen solid. The dog howled again. I slipped out my backpack, which was loaded with books, and used it for a step. I clambered over the gate, banging my knee on the Beware of Dog sign, and going to the other knee on the far side, when one of my sneakers caught at the top. I wondered if I could broad jump it back to the sidewalk if the dog decided to come after me in the way it had at Andy. I remember the old cliché about fear giving somebody wings and hoped I wouldn't have to find out if that was true. I was football and baseball. I left high jumping to the trackies. I ran around the back, the high grass wickering against my pants. I don't think I saw the shed, not then, because I was mostly looking for the dog. It was on the back porch. Andy Shen said it must have gone 120 pounds, and maybe it did when we were just little kids with high school far in our future, but the dog I was looking at couldn't have weighed more than 60 or 70. It was skinny with patchy fur and a bedraggled tail and muscle that was mostly white. It saw me, started down the rickety steps and almost fell avoiding the man who was sprawled on them. It came at me, but this was no full out charge, just a limping arthritic run. Radar, down! I said, not really expecting it to obey me, but it went to its belly in the weeds and began to whine. I gave it a wide berth on my way to the back porch, just the same. Mr. Bowditch was on his left side. There was a knot pushing out his khaki pants above his right knee. You didn't need to be a doctor to know the leg was broken, and based on that bulge, the break had to be pretty bad. I couldn't tell how old Mr. Bowditch was, but pretty old. His hair was mostly white, although he must have been a real carrot top when he was younger because there were still streaks of red in it. They made it look like his hair was rusting. The lines on his cheeks and around his mouth were so deep they were grooves. It was cold, but his forehead was beaded with sweat. Need some help, he said. Fell off the fucking ladder, he tried to point. That made him shift a little on the steps and he groaned. Have you called 911? I asked. He looked at me as I was stupid. The phone's in the house, boy. I'm out here. I didn't understand that until later. Mr. Bowditch had no cell phone, had never seen the need to get one, hardly knew what they were. He tried to move again and bared his teeth. Jesus, this hurts. Then you better stay still, I said. I called 911 and told them I needed an ambulance at the corner of Pine and Sycamore because Mr. Bowditch took a fall and broke his leg. I said it looked like a bad break. I could see the bone poking out of the leg of his pants and his knee looked swollen too. The dispatcher asked me for the house number, so I asked Mr. Bowditch. He gave me that was you born stupid look again and said number one. I told the lady that and she said they send an ambulance right away. She said I could stay with him and keep him warm. He's sweating already, I said. If the break is as bad as you say, sir, that's probably shock. Mm, okay. Radar limped back, ears flattened, growling. Stop it, girl, Bowditch said. Get low. Radar, she, not it, went on her belly at the foot of the steps with what looked like relief and started to pant. I took off my letter jacket and started to spread it over Mr. Bowditch. What the hell are you doing? I'm supposed to keep you warm. I am warm. 
but I saw that he really wasn't because he'd started to shiver. He lowered his chin to look at my jacket. High school kid are you? Yes sir. Red and gold, so he'll view. Yes. Play sports, football and baseball. The hedgehogs, what? He tried to move and gave a cry. Radar pricked up her ears and looked at him anxiously. What a silly name that is. I couldn't agree. You better not try to move, Mr. Baudic. Steps are digging into me everywhere. I should have stayed on the ground, but I thought I could make it to the porch. Then inside. Had to try. Going to be fucking cold out here before long. I thought it was pretty fucking cold already. Glad you came. Guess you heard the old girl howling. Her first, then you calling, I said. I looked up at the porch. I could see the door, but I don't think he would have been able to reach the knob without getting up on his good knee, which I doubted he'd have been able to. Mr. Bowditch followed my gaze. Dog door, he said. Thought maybe I could crawl through. He grimaced. I don't suppose you have any painkillers, do you? Aspirin or something stronger? Playing sports and all? I shook my head. Faint. Very faint. I could hear a siren. What about you? Do you have any? He hesitated and nodded. Inside. Go straight down the hall. There's a little bathroom off the kitchen. I think there's a bottle of Empyrean in the medicine cabinet. Don't touch anything else. I won't. I knew he was old and in pain, but I was still a little sheathed off by the implication. He reached out and grabbed my shirt. Don't snoop. I pulled away. I said I won't. I went up the steps. Mr. Bowditch said, Radar, go with. Radar limped up the steps and waited for me to open the door rather than using the hinged flap cut in the bottom panel. She followed me down the hall, which was dim and sort of amazing. One side was stacked with old magazines done up in bundles that were tied with hay rope. I knew of some, like Life, and Newsweek, but there were others, Collier's, Dig, Confidential, and All Man, that I'd never heard of. The other side was stacked with books, most of them old and with that smell that old books have. Probably not everyone likes that smell, but I do. It's musty, but good must. The kitchen was full of old appliances, the stove a hot point, the sink porcelain, with rust rings from our hard water, the faucets with those old timey spoke handles, the floor linoleum so worn I couldn't tell what the pattern was, but the place was neat as a pin. There was one plate and one cup and one set of silverware, knife, fork, spoon, in the dish drainer. That made me feel sad. There was a clean dish on the floor with radar printed around the rim, and that made me feel sad too. I went into the bathroom, which was not much bigger than a closet, nothing but a toilet with a lid up and more rust rings around the bowl, plus a basin with a mirror over it. I swung the mirror back and saw a bunch of dusty patent medicines that looked like they came over on the ark. A bottle on the middle shelf said Empyrin. When I grabbed it, I saw a little pellet behind it. I thought it was a BB. Radar waited in the kitchen because there really wasn't room enough for both of us in the bathroom. I took the cup from the dish drainer and filled it from the kitchen tap. Walked back down the hall of old reading matter with radar padding right behind me. Outside, the siren was louder and closer. Mr. Bowditch was lying with his head down on one forearm. You okay? I asked. He raised his head so I could see his sweaty face and haggard dark ringed eyes. Do I look okay? Not really, but I'm not sure you should be taking these pills. The bottle says they expired in August of 2004. Give me three. Jeez, Mr. Bowditch. Maybe you should wait for the ambulance. They'll give you- Just give them to me. Whatever does not kill me makes me stronger. Don't suppose you know who said that, do you? They teach you nothing these days. Nietzsche, I said. Twilight of the Idols. I'm taking world history this quarter. Bully for you. He fumbled in his pants pocket, which made him groan. But it didn't stop until he brought out a heavy ring of keys. 
Lock that door for me, boy. It's the silver key with a square head. The front one's locked already. Then give them back to me. I worked the silver key off the key ring, then gave the ring back. He got it into his pocket, groaning some more as he did. The siren was closed now. I hoped they'd have better luck with a rusty bolt than I'd had. Otherwise, they'd have to knock the gate off the hinges. I started to get up, then looked at the dog. Her head was on the ground between her paws. She never took her eyes off Mr. Bowditch. What about Radar? He gave me that was you born stupid look again. She can go inside through the dog door and out when she needs to do her business. A kid or small adult who wanted to have a look around and steal something could also use it, I thought. Yeah, but who's going to feed her? I uh, probably don't need to tell you that my first impression of Mr. Bowditch wasn't good. I thought it was a bad-tempered grooge, and it was no wonder he was living alone. A wife would have killed him or left. But when he looked at the aging German Shepherd, I saw something else. Love and dismay. You know that saying about being at your wit's end? Mr. Bowditch's face said he was there. He must have been in excruciating pain, but right then all he could think about, all that he cared about, was his dog. Shit, 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 shit. I can't leave her. I'll have to take her to the goddamn hospital. The siren arrived out front and unwound. The doors slammed. They won't let you, I said. You must know that. His lips tightened. Then I'm not going. Oh yes you are, I thought. And then I thought something else, only it didn't seem like my thought at all. I'm sure it was, but it didn't seem that way. We had a deal. Never mind picking up litter on the highway. This is where you hold up your end of it. Hello? Someone shouted. EMT is here. Is there someone who can open the gate? Let me keep the key, I said. I'll feed her. Just tell me how much and... Hello? Someone answer or we're coming in? And how often? He was sweating heavily now and the rings under his eyes were darker, like bruises. Let them in before they break down the goddamn gate! He let out a harsh, ragged sigh. What the fucking mess! The man and woman on the sidewalk were wearing jackets that said Arcadia County Hospital Ambulance Service. They had a gurney with shitload of equipment piled on it. They had moved aside my backpack and a man was trying his best to yank the bolt. He was having no more luck than I did. He's round back, I said. I heard him calling for help. Great, but I can't get this thing. Take hold, kid. Maybe with both of us. I took hold and we pulled. The bolt finally shot back, pinching my thumb. In the heat of the moment, I hardly noticed, but by that night, most of the nail had turned black. They went alongside the house, the gurning bumping in its way through the high grass, the equipment piled on top of it jittering and jibbing. Radar came limping around the corner, growling and trying to sound fearsome. She was giving it her best shot, but after all that excitement, I could see that she didn't have much left. Down Radar, I said, and on her belly she went, looking grateful. The EMTs still gave her a wide berth. They saw Mr. Bowditch sprawled on the porch steps and got busy unloading their gear. The woman made soothing comments about how it didn't look that bad and they'd give him something to make him more comfortable. He already had something, I said. I took the Emperor bottle out of my pocket. The male EMT looked at it and said, Jesus, these are ancient. Any pop they had is long gone. CC Demerol. 20 should do it. Radar was back. She gave CC a token growl, then went to her master, whining. Bowditch stroked the top of her head with a cupped hand, and when he took it away, the dog huddled on the steps next to him. That dog saved your life, sir, I said. She can't go to the hospital, and she can't go hungry. I was holding the silver backdoor key. He looked at it while CC gave him a shot that he didn't even seem to register. He gave another harsh sigh. 
All right, what fucking choice do I have? Her food is in a big plastic bottle in the pantry behind the door. She gets a cup at six and one at six in the morning if they keep me overnight. He looked at the male EMT. Will they? Don't know, sir. That's above my pay grade. He was unwrapping a blood pressure cuff. CC gave me a look that said, yeah, they'd be keeping him overnight. And that was just for starters. Cup at six tonight, six tomorrow. Got it. Uh, I don't know how much food is left in that bucket. His eyes were starting to get glazy. Uh, if you need to buy more, go to the pet pantry. She eats Orion Regional Red. No meat and no snacks. A boy who knows who Nietzsche was can probably remember that. I remember. The male EMT had pumped up the blood pressure cuff and whatever he was seeing, uh, he didn't like it. We're going to get you on the gurney, sir. I'm Craig and this is Cece. I'm Charlie Reed, I said. He's Mr. Bowditch. I don't know his first name. Howard, Mr. Bowditch said. They made to lift him, but he told them to wait. He held radar by the sides of her face and looked into her eyes. You be a good girl. I'll see you very soon. She whined and licked him. A tear ran down one of his cheeks. Maybe it was pain, but I don't think so. There's money in the floor canister in the kitchen, he said. Then his eyes cleared for a moment and his mouth tightened. Uh, belay that. Flower canister's empty, I forgot. If you... Sir, CC said. We really need to get you into the... He glanced at her and told her to hush a minute. Then he looked back to me. Uh, if you need to buy another bag of food, pay for it yourself. I'll pay you back. Understand? Yes, I understood something else. Even with some prime dope doing a number on him, Mr. Bowdish knew he wouldn't be back tonight or tomorrow night. Uh, Alright then, take care of her. She's all I've got. He gave Radar a final stroke, ruffling her ears, then nodded to the EMTs. He gave a cry through his clamped teeth when they lifted him and Radar barked. Uh, boy! Yes? Don't snoop! I didn't dignify that with an answer. Craig and Cece more or less lifted the gurney around the side of the house so as not to joggle him too much. I went over and looked at the extension ladder in the grass, then up at the roof. I guessed he'd be cleaning out the gutters or trying to. I went back to the steps and sat down. Out front the siren started up again loud at first and then diminishing as it headed down the hill to the goddamn bridge. Radar looked towards the sound, her ears pricking up. I tried stroking her. When she didn't bite or even growl, I did it again. Looks like it's just you and me, girl, I said. Radar put her muscle on my shoe. <sighs> he didn't even say thank you, I told her. What a snot. But I wasn't really mad, because it didn't matter. I didn't need to be thanked. This was payback. I called dad and filled him in as I walked around the house, hoping no one had stolen my backpack. Not only was it still there, one of the EMTs had taken a moment to drop it over the gate. Dad asked me if there was anything he could do. I told him no. I'd stay where I was and do some studying until it was time to feed Radar at 6, then come home. He said he'd pick up some Chinese and see me when I got there. I told him I loved him and he said, right back at ya. I fished the bike lock out of my pack, thought about lifting the Schwinn over to the house side, then said screw it and just locked it to the gate. I took a step back and almost tripped over Radar. She yelped and scrambled away. Sorry girl, sorry. I knelt and held out my hand. After a moment or two, she came to it, sniffed and gave it a little lick. So much for Kudio the Terrible. I went around back with her right behind me and that's when I noticed the outbuilding. I figured it for a tool shed. No way was it big enough for a car. I thought about putting the downed ladder inside and decided not to bother since it didn't look like rain. As I discovered later, 
I would have toted it the 40 yards or so to no avail because there was a huge padlock on the door and Mr. Bowditch had taken the rest of the keys. I let us in, found an old fashioned light switch, the kind that turns, and walked down the hall of old reading matter to the kitchen. The light there was provided by an overhead frosted glass fixture that looked like part of the set dressing in one of those old TMC movies Dad liked. The kitchen table was covered with checked oil cloth, faded but clean. I decided everything in the kitchen looked like set dressing from an old movie. I could almost imagine Mr. Chips strolling in wearing his gown and mortarboard. Or maybe Barbara Stanwyck telling Dick Powell he was just in time for a drink. I sat down at the table. Radar went under it and settled with a small ladylike grunt. I told her she was a good girl and she thumped her tail. Don't worry, he'll be back soon. Maybe, I thought. I spread out my books, did some math problems and then put in my earpods and played the next day's French assignment, a pop song called Rien Cuen Fios, which means something like just once. Now, not exactly my cup of tea, I'm more of a, of a classic rock guy, but it was one of those songs you like more every time you hear it, until it turns into an earworm that is, and then you hate it. I played it through three times, then sang along, as we'd been required to do in class. Je suis ce que tu es quel quel, just to show attend you. One verse in, I happened to look under the table and saw Radar looking at me with her ears laid back, an expression that looked suspiciously like pity. <laughs> it made me laugh. Better not quit my day job, right? A thump of the tail. Don't blame me, it's an assignment. Want to hear it one more time? No? <laughs> me either. I spied four matching canisters set up in a line on the counter to the left of the stove marked sugar, flour, coffee and cookies. I was pretty damn hungry. At home I would have checked the fridge and gobbled half the contents, but of course I wasn't at home and wouldn't be for, I checked my watch, another hour. I um, decided to investigate the cookie jar, which surely wouldn't count as snooping. It was filled to the top with a mixture of pecan sandies and those chocolate covered marshmallow jobbies. I decided that since I was dog sitting, um, Mr. Bowditch wouldn't miss one. Or two. <laughs> Even four. <laughs> I made myself stop there. But it was hard. Those sandies were certainly delicious. I looked at the flower canister and thought of Mr. Bowditch saying there was money in there. Then his eyes had changed, sharpened. Belay that, flower canisters empty, I forgot. I almost peeked, and there was a time not so long ago when I would have, but those days were gone. I sat back down and opened my world history book. I plowed through the heavy stuff about the Treaty of Versailles and German reparations. And when I looked at my watch again, there was a clock over the sink, but it had stopped. I saw it was quarter to six. I decided that was close enough for government work and decided to feed radar. I figured the door next to the fridge had to be the pantry, and I figured right. It had that good pantry smell. I pulled down the dangling cord to turn on the light and for a moment forgot all about feeding radar. The little room was canned goods and dry goods from top to bottom and side to side. There was spam and baked beans and sardines and saltines and Campbell's soup, pasta and pasta sauce, bottles of grape and cranberry juice, jars of jelly and jam, cans of veggies by the dozens and maybe hundreds. Mr. Bowditch was all set for the apocalypse. Radar gave a don't forget the dog whine. I looked behind the door 
And there was her plastic food canister. It had to hold 10 or 12 gallons full, but the bottom was barely covered. Baudis was in the hospital for a few days, or even a week. I would have to buy more. The cup measure was in the canister. I filled it and poured the kibble into the dish with her name on it. Raider went at it with a will, tail wagging slowly from side to side. She was old, but still happy to eat. I guess that was good. You take it easy now, I said, pulling on my jacket. Be a good girl and I see you in the morning, only. It wasn't that long. Dad and I picked on Chinese food. I gave him the expanded version of my afternoon adventure, starting with Bowditch on the steps, progressing to the hall of old reading matter, and finishing with the doomsday pantry. Hoarder, Dad said. Seen my share of it, usually after the hoarder in question dies. But the place is clean, you say? I nodded. The kitchen at least. Uh, a place for everything and everything in its place. There was some dust on the old medicine bottles in the little bathroom, but I didn't see anywhere else. No car. Nope. And not room for one in his tool shed. He must have his groceries delivered. And of course there's always Amazon, which by 2040 will be the world government the right wingers are so afraid of. I wonder where his money comes from and how much is left. I wondered that too. I think that kind of curiosity is pretty normal in people who come within a whisker of going broke. Dad got up. I bought and carried. Now I need to clear some paperwork. You clean up. I cleaned up, then practiced some blues tunes on my guitar. I could play almost anything, just as long as it was in the key of E. Usually I could get into the music until my fingers hurt, but not that night. I put my Yamaha back in the corner and told dad I was going up to Mr. Bowditch's house to check on radar. I kept thinking of her being there all by herself. Maybe dogs didn't care about such things, but, but maybe they did. Fine, as long as you don't decide to bring it back. Her. Okay. But not interested in listening to a lonely dog howl at 3 in the morning, no matter what sex it happens to be. I won't bring her back. He didn't need to know that the idea had at least crossed my mind. And don't let Norman Bates get you! I looked at him, surprised. What? You think I didn't know? He was grinning. People were calling it a psycho house long before you and your friends were born, little hero. That made me smile. But it was harder to see the humor when I got to the corner of Pine and Sycamore. The house seemed to hulk on its hills, blotting out the stars. I remembered Norman Bates saying, Mother, so much blood, and wished I'd never seen the damn movie. The gate bolt was easier to pull at least. I used my phone's flashlight to walk around the house. I ran my flash over the side of it once, I wished I hadn't. The windows were dusty, all the shades pulled. Those windows looked like blind eyes that were somehow still seeing me and not liking my intrusion. I rounded the corner and as I started towards the back porch there was a thump. It started me and I dropped my phone. As it fell I saw a moving shadow. I didn't cry out but I felt my balls crawl and pull up tight against my scrot. I froze as the shadow rippled towards me and then, before I could turn and run, Radar was whining and nosing at the leg of my pants and trying to jump up on me. Because of her bad back and hips, all she could do was make a series of abortive lunges. The thump must have been the dog door swinging shut. I dropped to my knees and grabbed her. One hand stroking her head while the other scratched her rough under the collar. She licked my face and crammed against me so tight that she almost tipped me over. It's okay, I said. Were you scared to be alone? I bet you were. And when was the last time she had been alone? If Mr. Bowditch didn't have a car and all his groceries were delivered? Maybe not for a long time. That's okay. All good. Come on. 
I picked up my phone, gave my balls a second to set it back into the proper place, then went to the back door with her walking so close behind me that her head kept bumping my knee. Once upon a time, Andy Shen had encountered a monster dog in the front yard of this place. Or so he said. But that was years ago. This was just a scared old lady who'd heard me coming and bolted out through her dog door to meet me. We went up the back porch steps. I unlocked the door and used the turn switch to light the hall of old reading matter. I checked the dog door and saw there were three small bolts, one on each side and another on top. I reminded myself to run them before I left so radar wouldn't go wandering. The backyard was probably fenced like the front one, but I didn't know that for sure, and for the time being, she was my responsibility. In the kitchen, I knelt in front of Radar and stroked the sides of her face. She looked at me attentively, ears pricked. I can't stay, but I'm going to leave a light on, and I'll come back tomorrow morning and feed you, okay? She whined, licked my hand, and then went to her dish. It was empty, but she gave it a few licks and then looked at me. The message was pretty clear. No more until morning, I said. She lay down and put her muscle on her paw, never taking her eyes off me. Well... I went to the canister marked cookies. Mr. Bowditch had said no meat and no snacks, and I decided he could have meant no meat snacks. Semantics are wonderful, aren't they? I vaguely remember hearing or reading somewhere that dogs are allergic to chocolate, so I took one of the pecan sandies and broke off a piece. I offered it. She sniffed and then took it delicately from my fingers. I sat down at the table where I had done my studying, thinking I should just go. She was a dog, for Christ's sake, not a child. She might not like being alone, but it wasn't like she was going to get into the cabinet under the sink and drink bleach. My phone buzzed. It was dad. Everything okay there? Fine, but it's good I came. I left the dog door open. She came out when she heard me. No need to tell him that when I saw that moving shadow, I'd had a single flash of Janet Leigh in the shower, screaming and trying to avoid the knife. Not your fault. You can't think of everything. Coming back? Pretty soon, I looked at Radar looking at me. Dad, maybe I should. Bad idea, Charlie. You got school tomorrow. She's a grown up dog. She'll be fine overnight. Sure, I know. Radar got up, a process that was a little painful to watch. When she got her hind quarters under her, she walked off into the dark of what was probably the living room. I'll just stay for a few minutes. She's a nice dog. Okay. I ended the call and heard a low squeaking sound. Radar came back with a toy in her mouth. I thought maybe it was a monkey, but it was so shooed it was hard to tell. I still had my phone in my hand, so I took a picture. She brought me the toy and dropped it by my chair. Her eyes told me what I was supposed to do. I gave it a soft lob across the room. Radar limped after it, picked it up, made it squeak a few times to show who it was who was boss and brought it back. She plunked it down beside my chair. I could imagine her as a young dog, heavier and much more agile, going after that poor old monkey, or its predecessor, at the full tilt run, the way Andy said she'd run at him that day. Now her running days were over, but she was giving it her best shot. I could imagine her thinking, see how good I am at this, stick around and I can do it all night. Only she couldn't, and I couldn't stay. Dad wanted me home, and I doubted if I'd sleep much anyway if I stayed here. Too many mysterious creaks and groans, too many rooms where anything might be lurking and creeping towards me once the lights were out. Radar brought the squeaky monkey back. No more, I said. Rest up, girl. I started for the back hall, then had an idea. I went to the darkened room where Radar had found our toy and groped around for a switch. Hoping nothing, Norman Bates' wrinkled mummy of a mother, for instance, would grab my hand. 
The switch made a clacking sound when I found it and flipped it. Like the kitchen, Mr. Bowditch's living room was old timey but neat. There was a couch upholstered in dark brown fabric. It looked to me as if it hadn't had much use. Most of the sitting appeared to have been done in an easy chair plonked down in the middle of an old fashioned rag rug. I could see the divot made by Mr. Bowditch's skinny shanks. A blue chambray shirt was tossed over the back. The chair faced a TV that looked prehistoric. There was an antenna thing on top of it. I took a picture of it with my phone. I didn't know if a TV that ancient could possibly work, but judging by the books stacked on either side of it, many marked with post-it notes, it probably didn't get much use even if it did work. In the far corner of the room was a wicker basket, piled high with dog toys, and that said all anyone would need to know about how much Mr. Bowditch loved his dog. Radar padded across the room and grabbed a stuffed rabbit. She brought it to me, looking hopeful. Can't, I said. But you can have this. It probably smells like your guy. I grabbed the shirt off the back of the chair and spread it on the kitchen floor beside her dish. She smelled it, then lay down on it. Atta girl, I said. See you in the morning. I started for the back door, thought again, and brought her the stuffed monkey. She gave it a shoe or two, maybe just to please me. I backed off a few steps and took another picture with my phone. Then I left, not forgetting to bolt the dog door. If she messed inside, I would just have to clean it up. As I walked back home, I thought about gutters no doubt plugged with leaves, the unmoved lawn. The place badly needed a paint job, and that was beyond me, but I could do something about those dirty windows. Not to mention the sagging picket fence. If I had time, that was, and given the upcoming baseball season, I didn't. Plus there was radar. That was love at first sight. For her, as well as for me, maybe. If the idea strikes you as weird or corny or both, all I can say is deal with it. As I said to my father, she was a nice dog. When I went for bed that night, I set my alarm for 5 a.m. Then I texted Mr. Neville, my English teacher, and told him I wouldn't be there period 1, and to tell Miss Friedlander that I might miss period 2 as well. I said I had to visit the guy in the hospital. Be sure to subscribe, like this video, uh, share it with your friends and leave a comment of what you thought about my my reading here. If you like beer reads and you would like me to read other stories then you can comment about that too. I release my own stories on Patreon. I write dark fantasy stories that are inspired by spirituality and you can visit my Patreon by clicking this link or checking out the link in the description. And I look forward to welcoming you into the taste community. That's all for now. And a special thanks to all of my patrons. You're the reason I can do this, so I'm really, really grateful.